Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation on the Black Headache Study. It's not just a migraine. Today's discussion forms part of our Black History and Futures Month programming, Haired Women's, which is designed to celebrate the transformative work and achievement of Black Canadians, while also recognizing their struggles and sacrifices due to systemic discrimination. This year's theme is inspired by unity, a painting by up and coming black artist, Madison Cook, whose work incorporates themes of identity and representation specific to the black community. And like Madison's work, Women's College Hospital strives to build a community united in its vision for a healthier, more equitable world. And with equity at our core, we endeavor to learn more about and share Black histories and activism that are often erased to dominant narratives. So before we get started today, I'd like to offer a special land acknowledgement in solidarity with our Indigenous communities. As people of African descent, I offer this land acknowledgement acknowledgement and recognition in solidarity with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island in the efforts and deliberate intentions towards decolonization. I recognize the historical colonialism and ongoing colonialism that has led to the present day situation where land acknowledgements are often offered in place of land. And as someone of African descent, I recognize that many of us have come here by choice, while many of us are here as a result of historical force. As part of the community of African descent, I acknowledge the land of Turtle Island that sustains us, and I express deep gratitude to its indigenous peoples and pledge to honor our dignity and divinity that ultimately connects us all. So today's conversation is going to be led by Dr. Savindrini Lina and represents an important opportunity to discuss health equity as we learn more about headaches as one of the leading causes of disabilities in adults worldwide and how systemic discrimination impacts the ability of black patients not just to receive care but which often results in poor health outcomes. Our panel today <clears throat> will share institutional commitments to understanding and removing barriers to care for Black patients, and will highlight the group's innovative research to support Black patients who suffer from headaches with the purpose of garnering suggestions for delivering even more effective, culturally relevant care. So allow me to introduce today's panel. We're led by Dr. Savendrini Lina, who is a playwright and a neurologist. She works at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, as well as the Center for Headache at Women's College Hospital. She's a lecturer in psychiatry and neurology at the University of Toronto, and also teaches a course called Staging Medicine, a collaboration between the Theatre Center and University of Toronto Postgraduate Medical Education. And she's joined today by Dr. Candace Todd, a neurologist and headache medicine specialist at the Scarborough Health Network. Dr. Todd is interested in women's issues in neurology, specifically during pregnancy and the impact of on headache during pregnancy, as well as gender and racial disparities in neurological diseases. We're also joined by Stacia Stewart, a community health educator and advocate, postpartum and fertility doula, who offers services through Stacia Stewart doula services. We're also joined by Angie Antonio, a researcher and a first year medical student at the Cumming School of Medicine at the University of Calgary, who's completed a degree in neuroscience at Western University. And our panel is rounded out by Mohamed Ahmed Ali, who unfortunately is unable to join us today, but we wanted to really signal his contribution to the team, 
who's a seasoned public health and policy professional with a passion for health equity and making meaningful improvement in healthcare delivery and outcomes for all Canadians. So thank you for joining us again. And I'm gonna ask you to please put your questions in the chat function. And our panel will be addressing and responding to the issues and questions you raise at the end of the presentation. So now I'll hand you over to Dr. Nina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that beautiful introduction. Um, I'm just going to advance my slides here. And get the pre and start the presentation. Okay, um, can everybody see my slides? Great. Okay. Uh, so this is it's really a pleasure to provide just an introduction to the Black Headache Study here at Women's College um, called "It's Not Just a Migraine." Um, and uh, you've heard about the team already that we're really excited to have working on this project. And today we're going to present some of our methods, our thoughts about doing this work and also some preliminary results, uh, really important, um, and hoping to be able to discuss some of that with all of you and get your feedback and your insights into your own experiences and also um, our, our findings. Um, so we're really grateful for this opportunity. So disclosures, there's no sort of pharmacological interests or any other um, interest that the study is serving other than just trying to learn about the experience of headache in black communities in Toronto. Um, and then we do have funders from the U of T and the Faculty of Neurology, um, a quality improvement grant from the Department of Medicine here at Women's College. And then we have great uh, community collaborators um, in Parkdale Queen West Community Health Center, Black Creek Community Health Center, and Women's Health and Women's Hands. And we also really gratefully acknowledge the support and encouragement of Dr. Christine Lay and the headache team at Women's College Hospital. So, um, why we're gonna this is the outline of what we're going to talk about first of all why do we need to do a study like this um how did we engage community knowledge to shape our work how do we design and implement our study what have we learned and then dreaming a little bit at the end about solutions to some of the problems we've identified based on our evidence okay so i'll hand us over to angie antonio Hi everyone, I'm Angie. Um, as Suzanne introduced me earlier, I'm a first year medical student at the University of Calgary and I'm one of the research assistants involved in this project. So to get everyone acquainted, I would like you to all think about a time that you had a headache and you had been told to take Tylenol, a painkiller, drink water, or maybe take a nap. Well, I'm sure all of you have been told those things. And as we know, headaches are quite prevalent. But according to the Global Burden of Disease, headaches are amongst the most disabling conditions worldwide. And migraine, a severe type of headache, is the leading cause of disability in women under 50. So while everyone gets headaches, these common solutions are not always enough for everyone. And we see that there are large disparities that exist, and this leads to inequitable care amongst individuals, usually as a result of race and ethnicity. So why do we see this inequity? Well, there are several reasons why. First, there can be racial biases exhibited explicitly and implicitly by healthcare providers. Additionally, there are differences in headache that are rooted in social inequalities. Um, there's also difficulty with navigating the mistrust of healthcare institutions that are rooted in historical experiences. Additionally, we have the sociocultural beliefs and perspectives and systemic barriers to accessing care. So um, I just want to check that you're seeing the slides. Can someone shake? Perfect. Okay. Um, so we, um, in trying to deal with some of these big issues that impact headache experience in Black communities, we wanted to start local and really understand the barriers perceived by Black Torontonians when seeking treatment for headache disorders. And we had some guidance from our institution because in 2021, Women's College Hospital did conduct um, a very comprehensive Black community consultation and heard from the voices of Black providers and patients um, at the hospital about um, their experiences with healthcare. And some of the um, guidance that emerged from that report were specifically um, 
about developing programs for Black communities. And so um, instructions were to review the referral processes for barriers to access and community services in the hospital for Black community, to bring Black community into the hospital to find out what care looks like for them, look at how we can learn from lived experiences and determine the barriers to access care, and then what can we do to create culturally safe environments for Black patients and visitors? Now, um, we decided that given all of this um, advice that's coming from the community consultation, let's think about how we can implement this in headache care. So our, we also had guidance from the Anti-Black Racism Corporate Commitments, which instructs um, people in, within, working within the hospital to evolve partnerships with Black communities and the organizations that serve them. So that was another priority in our minds when thinking about how to do this work. So we had some specific questions that we developed based on all of this. What is the journey of Black patients seeking headache care at Women's College? What are the barriers and what are the facilitators? And what is the headache experience at Women's, women's College like for Black patients? So basically, how do patients get here and what's their journey before they get here? And then once they do, what's the experience like and how can we look critically at, at that and evaluate it? And that's how we came to our study design, how to answer these questions. So I'll turn us over to Dr. Candace Todd now. Can you hear me? Yes? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you for allowing me to do so. So, um, you know, headache in, or research in general in Black communities, there's a paucity of evidence. And especially in headache in Black communities, there's no evidence, hence why we're doing this study. Um, and so no data means no evidence, which is pretty obvious. And at the Center for Headache, which is a, you know, internationally known headache center and uh, one of the very few in, in Canada, there's less than 10% of the patients seen are from Black communities. And we know that there's more, obviously there's more Black patients with migraine uh, in the greater Toronto area. Um, and these individuals are not uh, in these, this headache center. So that's an, a problem. Next slide. So um, all we do have is we have US data. So African-American men receive the least uh, headache care nationwide. African-American patients are less likely to present to an emergency department for headache care. And they are definitely less likely to receive neuroimaging to rule out secondary causes of their headache, which is a huge problem. Next slide. Uh, again, U.S. data, uh, African-American patients report more headache days per month, greater pain intensity, greater headache-related disability. They're less likely to receive a primary headache diagnosis. They are even less likely to receive headache-specific treatments. Um, and I don't know how many individuals have seen this research, but it's Awful. So this is a 2016 study out of the University of Virginia, and they looked at cohorts of first, um, second, and third year medical students um, from a large public university. They did this study online, and they were read two mock cases, one of a Black patient and one of a white patient. And it is awful to know that 12% of these medical trainees endorsed false beliefs about biological differences between black and white Americans. More notable is that the nerve endings of black people were less sensitive and the skin of a black person was thicker than that of a white person. And that is out of 2016. Next slide. So we have a problem with extrapolating the US data, obviously uh, to Canada, we know that black communities in the GTA are diverse and unique. There's a shared historical relationship to colonization and enslavement. There's different migration pathways, refugee communities, and the health system in Canada and the US uh, vary in many different ways. So, so oh, yeah, next. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Taking all this into consideration, we also wanted to be sure not to perpetuate stereotypes or racist assumptions in conducting and constructing our study. We wanted to think about prioritizing equity and representation throughout the process. So trying to really deliberately make space in the conversation about how to do a study for voices that have been historically silenced. And we had to be very mindful with respect to ourselves, thinking about who are the researchers with respect to race and ethnicity, 
with respect to headache experience, with respect to gender, and coming from an academic institution with respect to the, our access, our tremendous privilege in terms of access to education and resources. Um, we wanted to also make sure that we were building expertise and changing the locus of power in research and healthcare through our work. So we wanted to make sure that we were looking for mentorship and training opportunities for black researchers and that there was a bi-directional learning process going on between us in the academic setting and our community partners um, and advisors. And we really wanted to make sure that we were recognizing community and patient expertise as complementary and different from healthcare provider expertise. And we really wanted to be clear that in doing this, we're opening ourselves up to challenge, to criticism and to tremendous learning, which, is, which has great potential to be transformative. So our initial research questions, which um, very simple, what are the barriers perceived by Black Torontonians when seeking care for headaches? And what interventions will improve access to headache care? We took these questions to um, our community consultation process and we had two layers here. Um, the first one was a community advisory uh, group and we specifically looked for individuals who shared both expertise in migraine and expertise in working in the community as not only um, care providers, but also advocates and activists. And so we have in that team, uh, Janelle Noel, who you all know from Women's College, Opal Rowe, who's a business leader in the Black community, and Stacia Stewart, who has been a longtime advocate and healthcare provider in a number of different um, uh, modalities in the Black, working with Black communities in Toronto. So we're very lucky to have this advisory group. And I'll turn our slides over to Stacia now. Thank you, Savendrini. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Um, so I'm going to speak really briefly about some of the insights from the community consultation process and from discussions um, with the advisors and, and the team. So I participate in the project um, as a community health worker. I work at one of the partner agencies at Parkdale Queen West. Um, I am a migraine sufferer as well. I am a doula and a graduate student focusing on adult education. And I'm also the parent of a child who suffers from migraines. So, um, so here on the slide, we just sort of have a little showing of all the fabulous partners that were able to come together and, and uh, create this project. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so so in some, some insights that we gained in this process, there's there are some clear benefits to engaging with community health sites regarding study development and recruitment. And we really are seeing more and more centers kind of co-designing research. So these sites really understand sort of the context to patient vulnerabilities, can really leverage existing trust relationships, community networks, and we really wanted to benefit from all of that as the study kind of came together. Some of the highlighted challenges, particularly speaking from the community health center perspective, really present around um, timeframes. Sometimes projects have their timelines mostly laid out according to institutional guidelines prior to connecting with us. And so we don't always have the capacity in terms of time to uh, implement an engagement plan that really works for clients and patients. Um, so an example of that is um, our recruitment rates are sometimes higher when the research facilitator can spend quite a lot of time in our programs on a regular basis to understand group culture, discuss the study, answer questions, et cetera. Um, and so depending on what, you know, what that looks like, we, we may or may not be able to like get a really great level of recruitment. Um, some barriers to participation are really around things that I think have already been touched on, mistrust of research, perceptions that research as research as extractive from community, a low sense of ownership in the process, and the impacts of racism in healthcare or the anticipation of racism in healthcare. So barriers around related barriers related to navigating systems. Um, or a lack of rights-based information, adequate access can contribute to lower expectations for specialist care. So for example, um, in another one of my roles, I coordinate a perinatal program where we might where we see high self-reported rates of interventions in birth um, without containing consent sometimes, but when I follow up with participants about complaints process or follow up, there's really minimal engagement and there's low expectation of good care that actually meets their needs. So access to adequate care also benefits from being framed in a rights-based context. And then um, community expertise and leadership 
are really key to understanding the context uh, that contribute less visible factors to people's experiences of accessing migraine care. So for example, if we're wanting to engage with people about access to specific health care, acknowledging and exploring how other health determinants such as um, access to nutritious food, housing stability are important considerations when we're mapping out what care models are working and, and how we can engage with folks. Um, another, another benefit of sh is shared learning in the ways that community blends treatment plans with prevention education. So if, you know, some sites where they're doing one stop shop kind of appointments or, or drop drop in programs are really important really getting on the ground feedback about how best how best to engage with potential participants um, one piece of feedback that I received from the team at Park Deal was that they wished that they had had the capacity and the time frame to have held like a community event or a social gathering for recruitment because this has proven successful in the past, but unfortunately just the timing, they didn't really have the resources or the staff allocated to be able to do that. Um, considering re reimbursement honoraria, it's good to consider in our design whether it's appropriate to integrate any kind of honoraria for participation and recognizing, of course, that we don't want to influence participation and engagement, but rather understand the time and the energy that it takes to participate in studies like this. Um, community context, experiences, and safety. So getting insights on issues from the community ahead of time can prevent challenges later with engagement. All communities have a lot of diversity within them, which, which, um, which has already been mentioned. Organizational culture really, really divert, really, really um, changes across different different geographic regions and things like that. In the city, pe pe how people communicate with patients, attitudes, and beliefs about research, getting feedback on all on what works in different unique settings can make for a much smoother process. Um, and then the last piece I just wanted to mention was around participant agency and empowerment and how those are really underpinned by individual and group safety and access to clear information. So really making clear, flexible processes with lots of stop points for checking in, revisiting consent are really key to overall engagement with the study as well. Next slide. So what does this mean in practice? So in the previous slide, I, I did speak a little bit about so many of these points. I, I think what I wanted to say here um, is that considering where in our studies, when we're developing studies like this, that we have room to create processes for mobilizing knowledge that really work from a bottom up instead of a top down approach are a good place to start. So specifically in terms of how we initiate research and determining the feasibility of our project, I think that we were really successful here in this project around um, engaging with community advisors early on so that we could contribute um, context specific information. And then additionally, really gathering all the key stakeholders at the beginning when it's possible to collectively articulate what are the values and what is the approach to partnership that we're going to take in the research process so that that process itself of, of design and development becomes a mechanism for learning and building practices for collaborative research and community that really gets at some of these nuanced influences and factors that we're talking about here today. Thank, Thank you. So you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, so the research questions were modified somewhat based on this uh, community consultation process. The first two were still reasonable, but we had to add another question in about how do we build safe and continuous guidance from community and patients into any new models that are developed out of this study. So that takes me to the protocol and Angie, if you can take over. Yeah, so in terms of the protocol, we recruited patients, we also interviewed them, and then we analyzed the data. So next slide, please. So for recruitment, we utilized patients and participants from the Center for Headaches at Women College. Um, additionally, we used the clients from the community health centers, and through informed consent, we were able to recruit those individuals and also compensated them for their time, as we know that there is a lot of energy that goes into um, relaying the um, experiences that they had um, during the um, 
during their time in care. So next slide, please. In terms of the interviews, we utilize open-ended questions and we also emphasize on listening and empathy for the validation of those patient experiences. And in this process, we're acknowledging that we are conducting an anti-racist study. So it was very important for me as a Black medical student, as a Black researcher, and also as a Black future physician to be the one to do this interview. And to be really honest, I felt very emotional after hearing some of the participants of these patients, especially in regards to how uncared they felt in the healthcare system. And we know that there's institutionalized racism. We know that there's mistrust. And in order to address those things and to facilitate open communication, it was important for their participants to feel as though they were seen, they were represented, they were, they were represented, and they also knew that I was on their side. So it was very important to have a Black interviewer. Next slide, please. And then the last phase of the protocol relates to the analysis of the data. And so we're using a method here called qualitative analysis, where the interviews are transcribed, and then we really read them closely, and we try to see what are people actually talking about, what patterns come up, how do different voices differ from one another, what are the themes that repeat throughout the different narratives. And one of the really good things about um, this practice of doing research in this way is it does require that the researchers really listen to the voices of participants. Um, so it really honors the fact that these voices have been, um, these ideas and thoughts and emotions often are expressed um, in, in order to help shift healthcare structures and patterns. Um, and what I also very much like is that this method of doing research will ultimately preserve and amplify patient voices because the uh, voice will directly be represented in any research or any writing about what um, is learned in the study. So, so you don't have to paraphrase people, you're really just hearing their voice. There's an opportunity for that. Um, so finally, we get to our preliminary results. And one piece I want to just um, add before we, we dive into those is that another uh, step in the design process is, of course, research ethics. So Women's College has a quality improvement research ethics stream that this project was vetted through. But we also considered that our community, our consultations with community organizations was another way of engaging in the research ethics discussion and equally important to what was happening within the institutional context. Because I think the final arbiter of whether a study has been ethical is how it impacts the community and how communities receive it uh, in the end. And what is that relationship about? Okay, I'll hand it over to you, Candace, for some results, okay? Okay, so there was a lot of themes identified in these interviews, as Angie explained, she kind of took patients through kind of a journey through their healthcare, um, and we tried to, to take these interviews and code them. And so one of the big themes that we we're trying to get at is, you know, how frequent, how severe, how debilitating are these headaches and um, trying to see if they meet the primary uh, headache or primary migraine just um, diagnosis. So many patients reported a range of experiences with headaches um, reflecting different ages and life stages and their journey within the headache, uh, with headache care. There is a variable duration of headache prior to specialist referral. Many individuals had onset of headache in their teens, which is very common. Many associated with head trauma or a secondary etiology like stru uh, structural lesion. Um, again, not very uncommon across the board. Next slide. So what does a migraine feel like? Um, this is an excerpt from one of the interviews. So this patient said it was so uncomfortable when I had migraines. I don't know how to describe it. It's like something exploded in my head and kept blowing and my head kept hurting. It felt like someone knocked me out. Um, and I thought, absolutely, there is something so wrong with me that my head hurts more than dying and nobody wants to tell me. So this is a, you know, a really good example, which we see throughout a lot of these interviews where people or patients feel very hopeless and they don't feel like anyone is there to help them. Next slide. 
Um, what does a migraine feel like? Um, this is another excerpt. And this individual said, um, I was kind of upset and kind of just felt lonely in a sense because uh, I'm in pain for so many days over a week and I'm trying to live my life, but it's really hard to do and not knowing why the over-the-counter medications were not working and not knowing what else can be done. Um, this individual was in dark rooms and with hoodies and ice pack and And that was the only thing that they knew how to do. And again, this, this is kind of speaks to next slide. So sites of care, this was important to us to really get a sense of where these individuals are going for help. Um, so there's a real range in um, access that patients were using, whether that was a primary care physician, a lot of walk-in clinics, the ER, um, and then we tried to get a sense of uh, who they saw prior to a referral to a specialist. And what we noticed is that there's an underutilization of ER departments, given the severity of the headaches reported. And we can probably try and, you know, hypothesize that that's because patients don't feel like they're getting help in the ER, or they can't take time off of work to sit in an ER for multiple hours. Um, and so they're, you know, these individuals are suffering in silence. So this was another uh, example that we saw in the interviews in regards to ER visits. And this individual said they've been to the emergency maybe once or twice. And um, at the, the time they arrived, they saw me, they gave this individual Tylenol and they didn't feel like it helped. And they've done MRIs and CT scans um, and they can't find anything. So this patient probably doesn't go to the emergency department for help any longer. Next slide. This is a huge theme, uh, a lot of suffering alone. And so they, this person says, I hate going to the hospital. I don't like it. I, they don't like it. They don't like sitting and waiting for long periods of time. Um, and they usually just try and take it into their own hands and nurse themselves back to health if they can. Next slide. So the diagnosis of migraine is huge because many patients state that they don't still have a diagnosis of migraine and they still don't understand what's going on. So this was a really nice um, excerpt from one of the, the, the interviews where this patient said they've been trying to explain to their family doctor for a long time, but they thought it was just a normal headache. Uh, she didn't know that she had a diagnosis of migraine. She doesn't know anything about headaches. She's the only person in her family to know that to have a, a migraine. Um, she doesn't understand it. She doesn't understand even now when she has a diagnosis of migraine, she doesn't even know what that means. And there's a lot of patients out there that are given diagnoses that don't truly understand what does that mean and what does that look like for them on a daily basis. Knowledge of migraine. Um, this was another excerpt from the, the study. They watched a video on what migraines are and they realized that it had something to do with the brain. It wasn't just a vein in your neck that was dilated, but maybe something that happens in the brain, which this patient felt like migraines should be looked at differently. It's not just a headache. It's not here, just take these pills and you'll be better in a couple hours. It's more than that. And now this patient is understanding it more, but back then they didn't. And I think this isn't just important for patients. And when we speak to our patients about primary headache disorders, you know, trying to uh, explain, you know, basics of uh, pathophysiology or just basic concepts. I also think that there's some stereotypes around migraine and headache around, uh, among physicians, even neurologists and primary care physicians, and not really understanding how debilitating it can be and how impactful migraine and headache can be on individuals' lives. Next slide. Do you want me to do this one, Candace? Sure, yeah. Okay. So we, we also looked at coping strategies that patients um, employed to manage their migraines prior to receiving um, proper diagnosis and care. So this is a very telling example here. I have a close friend who also has chronic migraine. And so I would talk, she and I would talk about them. She had a neurologist at that time. And she also just gave me pointers of what her neurologist would tell her. So I would be taking some information from my friends 
telling me and I would go to my family doctor and I told her about it. So here you have information sharing between women in the community and then they're trying to educate their primary care providers proactively. So there's a lot of self-advocacy that's going on. There's, and that's another theme here. The other theme that you see is women relying on family members to support them in the process of being seen by physicians so that they're not in those environments on their own necessarily. So one of my sisters, B, she came with me and she took me to my appointments. When she was upstairs with me, she stayed in the office and waited with me. I mean, like these are things that humble me. This is what I call good humbling. And so how important it is to have an advocate with you, to have somebody who's who you know will listen to you in order to amplify your voice with the physician. There's um, patients who describe just taking whatever medications or advice is given to them and not feeling like they can really advocate about what kind of care they want. So this is an example from one participant. I've gotten better at advocating for myself, not much. My sister still, you know, is much better. I'm a grown ass woman, but she is much better at being in people's faces and not budging. For me, it's like, I will still backtrack and be like, it's fine. I'll take the medication. You know what I mean? So here it's like, it's complex. Again, the relationship with family advocacy and also patients facing a power differential with their physicians. Um, there's patients that describe, and many of them doing a lot of independent research around migraine and headache, trying to get answers on their own. So here's an example. No doctor or medical pr practitioner were like, oh, like, let's take our time, do some research or do something for this client. It's like at the end of the day, it was in my own hands. Like if I never did that search, I don't think I would be receiving the care I'm receiving now for sure. And then here's another example of the self-advocacy. Um, and really having to push really hard uh, with different healthcare providers over and over again to get care. This is the thing. It's another thing to listen to. I've seen a lot of doctors and at this point in my life, if you're not gonna help me, then I'm going around you or I'm going through you. I'm going to find someone else who would treat me because eventually we'll find someone who will actually listen. That is the problem, you know, doctors look at your blood work rather than listen to you. Okay, Candice, I will hand this over to you again. So um, I think there's another big piece about um, migraine and how it impacts not just the patient, but the, the family members. And I, I like this because um, it, it talks about the impact on, on family. And so this individual is saying, I was a single mom, I was raising my kids. My eldest is 33, but when he was younger, um, he would cook something for his sister because he knew mom was not well and he had to learn to take responsibility early because sometimes mommy is not well. I would have to be in a room in the dark. It was really a struggle. And that's something that we hear often that this really impacts not just the patient, but the families. Next slide. Um, this this other concept of, you know, drug seeking, which is probably not a new concept to anybody who's, uh, you know, on uh, listening today. So partici um, this participant described frustration with being prescribed Tylenol and Advil repeatedly for migraines in the ER. Um, and this patient said, I figured out the term for it, drug seeking. That is what they made me feel like when I started saying it's not working and I'm still having serious discomfort. And the individual that they were interacting with would say, so what do you want us to do? Are you looking for morphine? And this patient is saying, no, they just, these patients just want help. They're not drug seeking. Next They're slide. very vulnerable to being stereotyped because of the basic constructions that the healthcare providers um, are employing. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's this other common thread that comes through um, these interviews, which is this concept of the angry black woman. I feel as though I need to be careful not to become the angry black lady. You know, if someone doesn't listen to you, doesn't hear you, you know you get angry, but I don't want to get angry because if I get angry, they would be like, oh, angry black woman. So I don't know what to do. So this, I think, speaks to the helplessness of, you know, we ask our patients to advocate for themselves, but for many Black patients, Black women, they don't want to stereotype themselves um, and because they think that that's going to impact their level of care. Next slide. Um, the not cooperative kind of along the same, same vein, you know, uh, I, you know, not to 
think of me somehow as not cooperative. I would cooperate. I'll take your medications, but I'm telling you, it does not help. In fact, it makes things worse. What really pisses me off is I don't know why people don't. It's like, I'm telling you this thing made it worse, like much worse. And so we try at least in the headache field to talk about medications, what's working, what's not working, try and mitigate side effects. And we have many people in the study saying, you know, people aren't listening to them, not listening to the fact that medications aren't working or they're intolerable. And this is a huge, you know, error in, in our healthcare system right now. Yeah. And we've presented these last three slides as um, examples of how patients are subject to racist stereotypes. But if, if you're looking at the narrative, they're often repeating these ideas about not being heard and not being seen, right, as themselves. So I think that's another underlying theme that we saw coming through in a lot of the narratives in a lot of different ways. Um, so there were, of course, um, some specific barriers to care that prevented uh, access to specialist care that people described. So lack of access to primary care, delay in referral to specialist clinics, ex the experiences of racism and sexism, some of them we have described here, um, specifically um, in encounters with ER physicians and sometimes primary care. Um, we did um, collect some um, feedback from patients about experiences at the Center for Headache um, and there was some evidence that some of the experiences are more positive. So in particular, receiving a diagnosis and effective treatment is important. So a patient who was interviewed was happy to be participating in the research and was saying, you know, I felt lucky that I didn't have to go through a lot to be diagnosed with a migraine to be seen and to have a medication available for me, which is something that everybody should have. And then described, patients described improved quality of life. So over the past year, I've not, I really didn't miss work because of migraines. Thank God I haven't, maybe twice in a year or before it would be more like days cooped up in bed. And the length of time I needed off because of migraines, now it's way, we're, we're way less. So it's been a big improvement for me. It was a light at the end of a tunnel. Um, and then another patient saying, I'm happy now that someone listens to me. Um, nevertheless, there are barriers that patients identify when accessing care at Women's College, including financial barriers. So lack of affordable treatments and lack of insurance coverage in terms of the things that we are recommending to our patients. And then access barriers. So struggles with the location of the clinic, transportation and parking, a lot of narratives describing multiple um, transportation modalities, access to come in for a clinic visit um, at Women's College. So our next step then is how do we use these data to create a clinic model that will actually meet the needs of headache sufferers from Black communities in Toronto? And we thought of some, some preliminary things. Of course, this is just our preliminary go through of our data and our brainstorming around um, some of these issues. And of course, we want to go through a much more robust consultation and discussion process. But things that have arisen would be referral pathways that go specifically through community health centers or primary care providers who work more specifically in Black communities, walk-in clinics, and using other social hubs and social media to educate patients about the availability of a service since patients are advocating with primary care already, um, creating engaging relevant educational materials and programs that can meet some of the education needs and support all the research that patients are already doing, um, provide care that makes people feel good and that makes them feel, feel seen and heard, and it's similarly affordable and convenient. We talked about what might the role of virtual care be in terms of increasing accessibility because patients can connect on their phone quite easily and increasing the length of visit time so that there's actually time to hear a patient's narrative properly. And then thinking about the power differential between physicians and clinic staff and whether that's changed by having um, clinic and physician staff who um, really more accurate, more directly reflect the community. And this might address the problems that patients describe with power. So here, for example, a patient really paints it very clearly. There's a differential between who you are and the medical person, whoever they are, from a person who treats you to the person who takes your blood pressure. There is a differential. You are at their mercy. You are already at a disadvantage. So it's a really profound sense of a power differential. And if we go back to what helps people feel stronger in relation to healthcare appointments, it was friends who they were sharing information with and family members. But the point here is that these friends and family members also share relationship and culture often with patients, among patients. So 
that these things can mitigate the power differences and need to be embedded more in the structures of clinics. We, we, you know, we're throwing out the idea of whether a community specific healthcare service could be part of the solution and looking at some of the precedents that exist with um, two-spirited, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, que and queer clinics that have been set up that are responding to community needs and being led by uh, staff that are from these communities. Um, and then groundbreaking and transformative work of, of community-specific CHDs like Taibu and Anishinaabe Health. So there's a lot to learn from these models that already exist in the healthcare system. Um, we think that these, these clinics could make a real difference, but they also need to serve as a hub for education for healthcare providers and for system advocacy. But this is, of course, consistent with some of the expected roles of an academic medicine clinic. Um, uh, all of this is fine and good, all of these suggestions, the preliminary ones, and even the interpretations of the results, but we will make sure to square the circle here by um, inviting our study participants back to join in focus groups to discuss the results and suggestions and see whether these things are really meaningful to them. And we also um, hope to engage with the community advisory groups and the CHC partners and leaders um, to see whether and how they would guide um, a model like this and in order to really address the needs that um, on the ground. Um, and then of course, finding ways to test this model on an iterative basis using quality improvement methodology to just make sure that we're always really doing what we intend to be doing. And so that is the end of the presentation. I need to thank all the panelists. I'm so grateful for this collaboration and to invite questions from the audience, which I believe Suzanne is gonna uh, facilitate for us. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating presentation. So we do have a few questions that have come in. So I'll just take them in order. So the first one uh, starts with a statement and then leads into a question. So it says, if in 2016, medical education is still affected by unfounded racist assumptions, how do we move forward? What advice would you offer on mainstreaming anti-racist research techniques and approaches to address health equity broadly? Okay, um, I wanted to ask you, Suzanne, so that question really is about how medical education can have a more of an anti-racist bent in a, in a broad sense, right? And I wondered whether Stacia, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but I think it'd be nice to hear from community about what you guys think is really needed and then take it from there about how we might be able to, you know, brainstorm together. Well, I mean, I think I, I probably won't speak from the perspective of, of research. <laughs> that's all. That's for you, pros. But um, I think from community, part of, you know, part of, of, of the challenge with recognizing that this, you know those who are being educated in systems that you know have that foundation and that historical those historical the historical bias and all of that is that some of that you know some of that change is going to take the time it's going to take and so i do think that where there are opportunities to put information and education in the hands of patients more so that they go and find that information and they go and know what 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 the options are available to them because there's one of the things that really struck me as i was reading your slides um suvendrini about the challenges and the impacts of racism in care is that even from my position as someone who works in community health who knows the things that you you know that you highlighted I still also read it resonated personally with each and every one of them and so really I was struck by the process of becoming a self-advocate the process of becoming an, an advocate for yourself takes you know access to information self-education, all of those pieces. And that was something that evolved over a period of time, right? And so I do think that there's something to be said of what does it look like to hand back power? What does it look mm -hmm. like to hand back information? What does it look like to teach the skills of finding information and education and all of that so that you can become your, your self-advocate? Because that's the kind of, you know, when we talk about those networks that share within families and communities, that's what we're sharing then. Right then, we're sharing those skills, and so I really think that that's um, from my from my perspective in community. I think that's an important piece 
of the puzzle. And I think that that's part of why um, I think it's important for us to know, you know, you have a, you have a right to consent and what, do, what does true consent mean? And what does mm-hmm. good care look like to you? And how do you define it? And what would you like? You know, we, we have to be able to dream a little bit to think, oh yeah, like this, I could feel better. You know, the, I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. Yeah, it's so interesting what you say, Stacia, because it, it, what, what arises for me is that like we often think in answering these questions about changing medical education, we're still staying with the top down approach, right? And we're think, and so if you go stay with that top down approach, you think, okay, what is the curriculum like, right? And you think about who's in medical school, right? And how can that shift? And then, but what you're saying is, how do we empower patients? Mm-hmm. So that yeah. change comes like in a more organic fashion, right? In a yeah, and um, yeah, democratic fashion. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really do. I do agree with you that it's still important to tackle it at all the, you know, at all the levels. But I think for me, as if I, if on the few times that I've been invited in to talk to medical students, I've talked about, you know, empowering patients. I've talked about, you know, what does your process look like, and how have you considered how you're going to hand back the power to the patient? Have you considered what that looks like in your? Do you talk about that in your education in your classes and? All that kind of that's all I'm talking about really. I'm not I'm not so much talking about what it means to be um, you know, the patient and what we already know that. And I think, you know, we have the Google, right? So like so you can you can yeah. look that up. But I think that the the process of understanding how do people get get the information that they need to make their to navigate their um their own process with systems, their own access to information. Um, and choice, you know, to know, because I, I, you can't know what you don't know, right? So it's, it's tricky. So yeah, I, I do, I feel like it's both. I think it's, yeah. it's looking at all the levels, but it's also um, starting from the, a bottom up approach. I would add too that, like, if I was to go with what's really important in medical education, um, to shift some of this racism, um, one of the very simple things that keeps coming up is about patients not feeling seen or heard. And one of the elements there is the amount of time that is spent in an interaction. And I say this as a healthcare practitioner, like in the clinic, in the hospital, we simply like the the way that our structures and our system is working, we just simply don't have the time to actually listen. And this practice of actually listening and trying to create a human connection with a person in front of you that doesn't have a ton of stereotypes, I do believe that those kinds of things are possible and that we can all do better at that, no matter what our background or position or local, local, you know, how we're located in the, in the conversation. And if we could shift that, you know, but that means the system has to create time and space for people and people have to be open to each other. So it's a kind of a philosophical difference in education training, right? Yeah, agreed. I just wanted to interject and thank you for those responses. There are two questions I think really kind of start honing in on some of the issues we've been discussing. So the first one is who can I reach out to for help with my headaches? And more importantly, how can we build support and resources for patients to better self-advocate? And the other question I think is, is timely based on the discussion is Is there a historic reason you think that headaches are affecting Black communities? And how can knowing that history lead to better culturally affirming care? Those are big questions. Yeah. Okay, so so there's many questions there. I think maybe, Suzanne, you're going to track whether we actually answer them all in the conversation. Candice, I wonder whether you might want to weigh in on why you think headache affects people in the black community the way it does and what like so we like we did go over the research and you've really gone dove into it and you can speak from an insider perspective as well so like I'm interested in your sure I mean I, I I think like you said those are huge questions that I don't know if we can you know completely answer again based on U.S. data there is a really amazing a uh, sleep specialist at a Brigham and Women's, and she looked at like just sleep disruptions in the Black communities in Boston, and she took into account 
you know, areas that individuals are living in? Is there more sound? Is there more light? You know, what, what things impact Black patients in their communities? And I think we don't do that as much in other specialties. What are their living situations? What are the other external factors that contribute to their symptoms? And honestly, we don't ask those questions. You know, I ask a lot about sleep apnea every day, but I, and I ask about morning headaches and whatever, but I don't ask about, you know, are you sleeping with, you know, how many people are in the room with you? Is there a street lamp in your room? Is there external noise? You know, what are your sleep habits? And so I think we can extrapolate that into more specifically, because I'm a headache specialist, but more into headache care and, and say, what are the external factors, lifestyle? You know, we ask about exercise. How easy is it for you to exercise? What is hydration like? Access to um, good, healthy, you know, food, you know, food insecurity issues. I think we need to delve in deeper into the lifestyle piece, which is what we focus so heavily on in migraine and headache in general, um, and try and help the best we can obviously address those issues. I don't know if necessarily headache is, I think headache is prevalent amongst many, but I think there's also this thing that we didn't talk about is if anything, I feel like Black patients don't endorse pain, they don't endorse headache, there's this concept of being strong and not asking for help. And, you know, and so I think through this study, we've actually found that a lot of people have been suffering in silence, and haven't kind of talked to their family physician, because they think, you know, if I'm weak, or this isn't a big deal, it's just a headache. And so I think there's probably a lot more patients um, out there than we, we really realize. Um, and it's just because we just haven't been face to face with these individuals. That's kind of my take. Stacia, any thoughts you want? I wish we had Angie here too. She's had to go back to class. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think um, I think, I don't know, everything that you were saying, Candace, just really struck me about, you know, around context. And, you know, it's like, we only have so much time, we're asking what we ask. But then there, you like you mentioned, there could be so, so many other factors that we don't know about, right? And I think, um, you know, in, in one of our prenatal education classes, um, programs at work, we do exercises, every single exercise is adapted to something you can do while holding an infant. <laughs> because, 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 right? because she can't put the baby down to do the exercise. She has to be able to do that. But so, because we have so much contact with, with, with the with the clients and patients, we do know a, a lot more in that setting about, their conditions in their home and all, so that sort of thing. And so we can kind of, um, you know, we can kind of glean what that means. I do, I do think that sometimes people might not, like they might, something might become chronic because of the fact that they just, they just don't actually get access to, they don't get access to care for that because it, it's sort of like, well, I'm focused on this, I'm doing this with the, I go see the doctor about this. So I haven't really had time to squeeze into that appointment talking about this other thing that's been going on forever or whatever. I think that, I don't know what that's called in terms of, you know, medical terms, but we do see that in, in community health. We do see that a lot where we're kind of the ones as people who are program people kind of encouraging folks to like, you know, that sounds like that's been going on a long time. You don't, really that doesn't have to be like that like maybe we can get you some help or we try to talk about we try to role play like here's in a 10 minute appointment here's how you can talk about these things you know like in 10 minutes so that it still fits in and you still leave with some information um, and ideally some referrals yeah so I yeah. think it, I think there's so many factors there's two things I would add maybe from a um you know, one of one of them is the life life story or life journey perspective, which um, we talk about this a lot in migraine because often migraine is onset in the teens, right, or even younger sometimes. And so it's what Stacia just mentioned and Candice about how patients have become accustomed to living with migraine, and it will fluctuate over the life course in relation to hormonal things, in relation to stresses that that people experience. But the problem is that you're used to experiencing it. And if you're not used to thinking that my pain is important or that somebody's going to care about it, 
then you don't really have the opportunity to seek treatment. You don't think that that treatment is a possibility. You don't think that that pain can actually go away, partly because you've had it for so long and partly because nobody's ever listened to it, right? And told you that it doesn't need to be that way. So I think it's that very simple thing of this is like, it becomes an ingrained and, 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 and you see this over and over again that, you know, a mother will have migraines and her daughter will have migraines. So the daughter thinks that part of being a woman grown up is having migraines that you suffer with, that you work through, that you cope with, right? And so it just goes on and on like this. And, and it, but it's all on the back of the pain that communities of color experience, not being the same kind of pain or not getting the same kind of attention as it needs, right? So that, so that was one thing I was thinking about, you know, in terms of why is this different? The other thing is that um, we know that um, racism is a source of stress. It's a huge source of stress for people in a very chronic way. And chronic stress is related to inflammatory responses in the body. So this has been well studied, actually, sort of at a molecular level, right? We know that there are certain hormones and certain you know, physiological parameters that are stress responses that become chronic when you're exposed to racism on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And they're not there when you're not. And so we know also migraine is a chronic inflammatory condition. And so where you have chronic stress, you're going to get exacerbation of migraine and you're going to be more likely to have chronic migraine, which is far more debilitating than an episodic migraine where you have a stress and then you have a normal life and then you have a stress and then you have a normal life. So that's, I think, the other big piece is that the stressors that people are subject to because they belong to Black communities are different. And that causes a different profile of headache. It, it puts them at risk for a different headache profile. So, so I want to question about how to get help, right? Right. I want to circle to back to that. How do we get help? And particularly focusing on how do we build and create resources to help patients better self-advocate. Yeah, so I think that's one of the things that in the, you know, we, we kind of glossed over it in our recommendations, but we talked about engaging meaningful programs that can be delivered to people through community health centers or through other community social hubs or, you know, apps or programs or sites, um, because a lot of migraine prevention can be behavioral and lifestyle oriented, but it's really much more powerful if you understand why you might want to do these things. And people do have agency to make, they don't have agency to make all changes, um, but they do have agency to make some changes often, right? And so certain things can be addressed this way. And I think it's about having people have um, sources of information that they trust and feel ownership over and can really interact with in a meaningful way. So it's not one directional. Um, where do you go for help is a much more complicated problem in our current system because it depends on whether you are articulated to a primary health care provider or a walk-in clinic or um, maybe a community health center or not any of those. Um, but I think the most important thing to know is what it goes circles back to what we said before about how migraine is a treatable condition and there's a tendency among Black patients because of historical experience not to be able to access care for that condition and sometimes to stop asking because they've been unheard so much, right? But um, I would encourage people to continue to ask your primary care physicians or whoever you encounter when you do have these headaches to refer you to specialist care because uh, there are really good treatments out there and there are things that we know not there's no the system's not perfect in terms of treatment but there's a lot that we can do right so you need to get you deserve to get access into these specialist centers so that then we can help with that and then send you back to whatever you're doing and it's better your life like not perfect but it's going to be a bit better so i think it's about keeping on pushing for now but it's our job is to try to also make it easier to get in at women's Great, thank you for that. I want to shift gears a little bit, going back to research frameworks. Um, and we're being asked, what advice would you offer on mainstreaming anti-racist research techniques and approaches to address health equity broadly? And a follow-up question was, 
how can those techniques be expanded for working with other equity deserving groups? So how do we build an anti-racist research framework? Stasia. <laughs> that's, um, that's a huge okay. question. That's a huge question. I mean, you know, so you know, I'm not the I'm not the big shot researchers here, but I will say one thing that I do feel like I contribute to that to that response is that. You know, I think that, you know, I think that I touched on how more and more we start to see, you know, community health kind of um, entities like initiating our own research. And I think that the ways that we do that, we, we can't um, ignore the way that we work. And so we do tend to do more collaborative more um, community-based uh, participatory methods, more, you know, more mixed method studies that really have embedded research design. Like, I think that really trying to think about what are the approaches to doing research that are automatically interrupting those historical ways of doing health research in our communities. And I think that what I said around the perception of research as, as extractive. Um, I know for myself as someone who has co-initiated research um, in, in the community health site, like it, it's a, it is a process, like it's a slowed down process. And it, it really, really had to spend a lot of time thinking about what trust and safety look like for participants in order to really um, be successful. And, and we were, it was really great, but I think it really struck me how long how long it took um, and how much we kind of had to kind of continuously be going back when we were you know just really in a in a in an ongoing dialogue I guess with with community around how to do this well and so you know I think that that's that's something to think about because we're you know institutions and systems we rush and we're focused on you know we're focused on on what we want to do and and think about how we want to do it. And I think there's other ways and other considerations. So, yeah, so that doesn't really answer the question, you know, you know really well, but it is a, an aspect of, of, of research that I think is an important to consider, especially for large institutions like. Huh? Yeah, you know, one of the things I think about this is um, it's a question of who you're accountable to. Um, so coming from a large institutional perspective, we usually think of ourselves as accountable to our REBs, which is good mm -hmm. and it's essential, right? No question. But I think what we wanted to try to do here is think about how is it that we can try to be accountable to our participants in the study and accountable to the communities that we're purportedly trying to serve right from the beginning. So it, it, there has to be some way in which you're automatically accountable right from the beginning. And you, and you can't expect the community to hold you accountable and do all that work. Mm -hmm. it, the academic partner has to do that work and make it possible, um, make it open, um, be flexible about what the objectives and process is gonna look like. And Stacia keeps mentioning time. So I think also the way we think of what's the important component of the research and how does the research question arise? It's even in that, like we didn't, our research question came as a top down. We thought about it in the Center for Headache, but we weren't exactly top down because we thought of it because of the community consultation report on anti-racism in the hospital. So that was a participant driven project. And so those voices, if you're really listening to those voices, okay, then how do we respond? And then how do we go back to the community and check that we did it? Right. So I think it's always you have to be aware of what's forming your ideas about your questions and your process. Thanks, Alindri. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask one final question, and I will let participants know that questions that were not answered on air will be answered on our web hub. So the last question, and I'll ask, invite each of you to just give a sort of summary statement. It reads, if you had to choose one area that hospitals should be more active in with regards to advocating for concrete solutions regarding anti-Black racism, what would it be? One thing. One thing. 
I can, I can start. I think the biggest thing that I've learned, one thing, is really engaging the community health centers because they're really doing the real work on the ground. Um, for me, being at Women's for a period of time, um, you don't really get a good, I didn't get a good sense of what's going on in the community. And I think continued engagement with the community health centers would likely to me be the key and um, kind of helping that population and engaging with them on a continual basis. That's my one thing. Thanks, Stacia. I think um, I agree absolutely, Candice. And I also uh, think that um, figuring out figuring out what mechanisms hospitals could use to engage other other patients who have very minimal engagement with healthcare centers and institutions. I think that even in, in community health, we see that there are always new people coming in who are not, who have no primary care providers and literally are just going from walk-in, you know, walk-in mm -hmm. to walk-in, getting all of their care. And I think that there's something to be said for, you know, how do you engage that like that aspect of the of the population who are just managing care. Okay, I think we've lost it, yeah. Um, so Benjini, you want to go? Yeah, so if you, it's really hard because you say one thing. So I'm going to say from as someone in women's college in this institution, one thing I think would make a, a huge difference is uh, bringing on more Black physicians into the clinic staff, because I think that that will give patients coming into the hospital a different feeling. I think that the hospital is moving in that direction and has a very mm -hmm. diverse physician body. And this is excellent and can continue to try to set an example in that way. And then can actually like hold up the work of those physicians in particular ways, right? And support uh, physicians who have interests in equity-driven research in many different areas, but I think it's all like, like there is a there is a role for leadership and physician leadership. I'm just speaking as a physician. There, there's nurse practitioner leaders, there are social worker leaders, there are programming leaders in the hospital as well. And I think in all these different roles, you know, it's elevating people who are doing who are really trying to walk the walk, and then. Um, supporting their research and the programs that are that, that are built because women's is in a position to really set an example here I think that I'll be honest I think that the anti-black racism report was hard but really important and really brave so I think that like if you've gone out and done that you've stuck your neck out and done the hard thing there why not like embrace it thank you I think what we're hearing is how do we create systems and structures and policies and spaces to ensure that we have culturally affirming care that takes into account the historical disparities that addresses and disrupts, as Stacia said, these you know, ongoing biases and creates new frameworks for us to do things differently, uh, not from the top down, but from a uh, not necessarily grass, but a community engaged, community involved approach so that we get it right and that we see improved health equity outcomes. So we are at time and this, I know there's so much more we can talk about and discuss. This has been a fascinating conversation. I just wanna thank each of our panelists for joining us today and you, the audience for joining us and for engaging and for your wonderful questions. As I said, the questions that were not answered on air will be answered in our web hub. So thank you again for joining us and we look forward to continuing the discussion. So enjoy the rest of your day. Be well, thank everyone. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for organizing this and Janelle as well. Thank you for, um, for, for providing us with the opportunity and, and working on this with us. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you.